I'm here today in Exeter, Rhode Island at my friend Will Palacun's mill. Uh, we've been here before, but having cedar sawn and different things like that. Today, we're gonna process this giant oak knee. Now, this thing is gonna get cut into quarter knees for the 23-foot boat that I'm building, the V-bottom skiff. And uh, there's quite a bit to do to it. I've shortened it up here. You know, we're gonna saw it right down the middle and three times and make two knees out of it. So it's the trunk of the tree and a branch right here. And what I'm interested in is the material on the other side of this branch and the top of that uh, the trunk of the tree right there. So it's gonna be quite a bit of work to process it. I don't have a huge chainsaw, but I've sharpened it a little bit differently than, than a crosscut saw, and it, it's going to rip pretty good. So, yeah, that, you know, that's what we're up to. It is going to be quite a bit of work, but uh, I think it's worth it. So, you know, it makes a skiff really pretty with quarter knees, you know, that have m uh, matched grain or book match, because when I saw it up the middle and you open it up like this, the grain on this side and the grain on that side are both going to match each other. So you put one in one quarter of the skiff and one in the other quarter of the skiff. So it's going to be pretty cool. You could probably get away with a smaller piece of uh, lumber than this or a smaller knee than this, but I think it's nice to have something this big. It's got nice quartered stock on this side, even the limb, because the heart is way over here in the tree. You know, whether that's a characteristic of all of these, I'd be interested to find out, because this is the first one I've ever really processed. But if they've got more space on the low side of the branch from the heart, that's a real good thing for me. And obviously, it's got plenty of space from the heart on this side. The heart's way down here. So I'm going to be looking at something like that and uh, the forward section of this right here. So I'm gonna need a real sharp chain on this chainsaw to take care of this. Well, I've got my chainsaw in this little stump vise right here. It's a pretty convenient little tool, really. You pound it in either the end grain or the side of a log and you put your chainsaw in there. It works pretty great, but uh, I've already sharpened this chain in the manner that I wanted it to be for ripping. Uh, it's not a rip chain, really, but it rips pretty good. And uh, the thing with it is that's different is I'm filing it uh, like 10 degrees across the tooth, right, like across the bar like that, rather than 35 recommended for, for uh, cross cutting. So it's quite a bit different. And what it is is uh, it's nice. It doesn't make the tooth pull sideways very much or this one pull this way. So it makes a narrower cut and uh, it's not aggressive on the sides. It's only aggressive on the top. So it rips kind of nicely, but I find that it cross cuts real good too this way. It's just it's not very forgiving because it cuts so narrow that whatever you're cutting can pinch the bar and then you can't get your saw out or it becomes very inconvenient. It's not for cross cutting, but I'm going to use it for cross cutting today. Now I'm touching up this chain. I've already sharpened it to this angle, but we sawed a little bit of wood with it already, and I'm just inspecting it because I want it to be ultimately sharp when I go to do what I've got to do. And uh, it's, uh, it's being filed on a 10 degree angle, which is specifically for ripping, but it seems to cross cut very nicely too. With this angle, it doesn't make a very wide curth when you're cutting. That's exactly what we want. We don't want it to be very wide. It just takes more effort to cut a big slot like that out when you can cut a nice narrow one. So this is what we're doing, you know, and there's a couple of ways of making the saw cut narrow. One is to bend the rakers over to the side a little bit actually, and then tune them up again. And the way I'm doing it right here is just cutting a 10 degree angle on the tooth itself, which makes it really perform nicely. So that's what we're up to. And uh, it doesn't look too bad. That tooth had a little something in it. Maybe I heard a little dirt or something like that. But, you know, it's not going to be uh, anything here to touch it up. Just like that. A couple little strokes. And uh, we're done. So, very simple. Very simple. I'm... Now, I'm only tuning this saw up a very, very small amount here. Uh, it's not really dull. I'm just looking at it and making sure I get the angles exactly right with the last few real light strokes, really. And uh, this is what you have to do. If I wanted to take a bunch of material off a tooth like this, it'd be better if I had it in a saw vise or just a bench vise because 
in the bar here, the tooth kind of rolls back and forth like that and makes the file bind a little bit if you don't make a real light stroke. So that's what you have to do is make a nice light stroke and uh, it works out pretty well. Now the other thing about this chain is this is not a chisel chain. It doesn't have square corners on it, very square sharp corners. It's got rounded teeth. I don't know what they call this, a semi-chisel or what they actually call it, but uh, it's the best for ripping. Now the only other difference between this chain and a real rip chain is that a rip chain's got two teeth like this, one on one side, one on the other. Then they got quite a space. Depends on how big the chain is. They might be missing six teeth in a row, but I think if you were making a real rip chain out of this, you'd probably take three teeth off in a row, right? and then you got two teeth, and then three teeth off in a row. And it just makes the teeth dig in a little bit uh, deeper, and you don't have so many teeth creating friction in the rip because uh, that kind of takes your power away a little bit now. I've never taken the teeth out of these, but it does rip reasonably well, just like this, with all the teeth on the bar. But, uh, you know, the, the rakers are down below the surface about 40 thousandths, and they're away from the side of the tooth about 40 thousandths. So, uh, you know, it's going to cut pretty aggressively still, even though I've sharpened it straight across. This thing is going to cut. Now I've tuned that tooth up perfectly and the rest of the chain too, but the next thing I'm going to do is just check the height of the rakers right here. Now the rakers just kind of clean the slot and they set the depth of how this tooth cuts. So they all have to be very much the same, maybe 40 thousandths underneath the height of the tooth. And uh, that one's really nice. That one's nice, so I don't even have to touch those up. They're already right. And uh, the only other thing I have to say about this is you don't want to turn this thing around and put it down this way because what happens is that tooth's not necessarily down against the bar, so it gets you a funny reading. You don't do that. You put the tool on there this way so it holds the tooth down nice and tight, and then you get a true reading on the rake at the height. Now, these rakers are a little different than a lot of saws. They're double. They've got you know, a, a, a connector link in here that's kind of got a raker on it, and this one out here. So, a little bit different, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great chain. It's going to work really nicely. It's got the right teeth nice and rounded on the edge, like I said, instead of chisel chain. Now, this may seem to be an odd thing to do. I've got an adz here, and I'm peeling the bark off. And I don't want to cut that bark with my chainsaw, because it's going to have to be really sharp for ripping. So. You know, this just makes a nice clean uh, piece of wood to cut, and uh, it's not really that hard to do. Now, this is the top of the branch right here, and that is where all the dirt really falls onto it. So, if there was any place you wouldn't want to have bark on it, it would probably be up here. So, it's pretty easy and uh, worthwhile. Now, right in here, see all this dirt right in here? That's just from dragging the log around in the, in the uh, lumber yard. But, uh, you know, I have to get that off. I don't want to cut through that. So that's just a severe example of the dirt on it. And pretty much everywhere I cut, I'm going to strip the bark off before I cut it. So this is just going to shorten up the branch a little bit here. And uh, we can get started with the chainsaw. Now, you see, you can use the ads kind of like a little fulcrum. I got it in there, and I just want to rip the bark off like that. You know, it's, you don't have to cut it all the way down. You just get under it and rip it right off like that. Now, we just finished working with the ads. We took the bark off, so we don't have to cut that with the chainsaw. And uh, now we're going to get started. We've sharpened the chainsaw right up. It's all ready to go. I just got to start it up and uh, get my posture just right so I can stand there nice and steady. And uh, we're just going to lop it right off. But uh, I'll show you a little bit of technique. The chainsaw can be dangerous. There's things you don't do with it. You don't let the tip contact the wood when it's on the uh, angle like that because it can kick right up after you like that. It does have a break on it, but it's still dangerous. If I was putting the saw down running, uh, I would, I, I would shut the brake off like that because that way no matter how high it's idling or anything the chain can't go around then you're going to pick it up it's already running and you put the brake back and you're ready to go so that's a little thing about the brake 
You know, the other thing I would never do is start it like some people do holding the handle like this. Because when you start it up, you rev it up, or if you were moving twigs or branches around and you're a wise guy, you'd be revving that thing up like that and you might hit a twig or a little branch or whatever and believe me, you're not strong enough to stop it when it comes up like this in this hand. You want the saw balanced, your hand as close to the center line of the, of the chain as you can get it, right? And then to start it, I use some momentum and pull the cord. When my saw is sharpened like this to rip only, a cross cut can be a little bit difficult because it's unforgiving. It's cutting very, very narrow. And you notice that at the end of this cut, it started to bind a little bit. So we placed a wedge in the first part of the cut and opened it up a little bit just to finish it off. Because the saw doesn't even have enough power to get itself moving once it starts binding like that at all. Now while Reed's peeling off some more of that bark with the ads, I have drawn a line right down here that I'm going to cut. Now it's not plumb because the whole crook is leaning over one way. So I don't mind that. I'm just going to follow the line. Uh, I'm putting a line across the top of it. I'm going to follow this line at the same time. And uh, I won't be able to cut the whole thing out just like this. I may have to go over on the other side and uh, make a line over there and cut down that side. This is going to be a little bit more difficult down in here because it's much heavier and bigger. So I'll have to cut in a lot deeper and everything else. I may have to come from the other side or something like that. But it, it won't be too difficult. Uh, you know, uh, you just have to go slow, be careful and expect to have to do some work because it's quite a bit of work. I've clipped some of the top of the branch off so that my bar would extend all the way through this cut because I'm going to be able to use that cut to follow down the other side. That helps me a, a lot. I can't line that line up on the other side with this line. I have no method to do it. So I want to cut right through the branch and out the other side. Once I've cut all the way through, I can extend that line down into the crook of the branch right down in there and then I can kind of line my eye up with that cut and draw that line all the way across the trunk part that I need to cut. So it's nice to have that cut right through to begin with following the line on the other side. Now the next thing I'm going to do is start cutting down this side and it's going to be quite the depth of cut right here. This isn't normally what a saw like this would do. It always surprises me when uh, you can pick a saw like this up and make extended cuts like this that take quite a bit of time. It seems like the saw would just blow up, but the thing will outlast you, believe me. You'll wear out before the saw does, so. Right now, what I've got here is a cut right down the middle of the branch, actually, that extends into the trunk of the tree. I have every intention of cutting the thing right in half exactly like that, but I'm going to wait for a little bit because I'm going to make two more cuts three inches from these. Those will be the slabs that I'm going to use for the quarter knees in the boat that I'm going to build. Now, uh, before I do that, like I say, I'm going to cut right down here into the trunk like this. Then I got to do a little bit of thinking about how I'm going to get rid of that stuff and how I'm going to extend this cut down. I might even have to come in from the other side a little bit. Same thing over here. And uh, then I'll split the thing. What I'm going to try to do is get all of this side wood off on both sides. The last cut will be down the center line, hopefully, if I can get the bar to go that far. And then what's going to happen is it's just going to open right up like that and, uh, and uh, be book matched just like that. So that's the last cut to finish right down the center. I like it like this because the thing is very stable. And when I do cut down the center in these other slabs, I'm still going to leave it connected at the butt end right here because that keeps it nice and stable, makes it stay right there. And uh, if I didn't make these cuts first, the thing would fall over and then I'd be trying to cut it horizontally instead of vertically. And that, that just wouldn't, I, I'm not strong enough to even do that. I, I just can't do it. You know, this is pretty simple because the weight of the chainsaw is doing the work. You know, I, I, all I have to do is have some finesse and I can get away with it. But uh, now what I've done is I've drawn two lines parallel to the center line right here, three inches apart from the edge of the cut. So I'm going to be cutting on this side of the line and that side of the line, so I remain three inches in between. Now I'd like to show you this right here, this notch in the top of the thing. I didn't cut that into it, that was cut when they topped the tree. They cut a notch in it flat like this, 
and then a wedge out of it like this on that side and then they came in from over here and the top toppled off that way like that. Now it wasn't done on the ground because they wouldn't need a fellas notch on the ground. This angle would never have been there. So what they've done is they've topped the tree because this is up in this direction. So they've topped the tree with a fellas notch like that and then they cut the rest of the tree down. So the whole the branches and the whole top wouldn't be on the tree when it landed on the ground. All these new saws have great chain speed, but that doesn't mean you don't have to use some technique or know exactly what you're doing to get something like this accomplished. It could be a terrible strain on the saw if you didn't know what you were doing or if it wasn't sharp. We're not gonna have any of those kind of problems right here. We've got it going on right here. Now I'm tilting the saw to 45 degrees to the surface because I don't wanna cut straight across the grain. It doesn't cut anywhere near as fast and it's more bumpy. So when I tilt it down like this, you're still making a cut that's long, it's 16 inches long, the length of the bar. It may not be 16 inches deep, but it's 16 inches long and it's cutting like mad. I can feel that it cuts way more aggressively when you sharpen it like this and when you tilt it like this than it would if it was a cross-cut chain. When I'm ripping straight with the grain coming out the other side, the chips come out like julienne fries. Really nice and uniform and pretty actually, as far as I'm concerned. Now I'm going to make the third cut, and this chain really works well. I might get a little twist in this cut, or the first one actually, but I, I'm cutting them in three buys. I only need two buys, so I'm going to recut them later, once I cut all the scrap of them off and get them down to size. So I've got some room for error here, but I do have to make sure I keep it close. Then I'll surface one side, recut them to maybe two and a quarter, and then surface the other side, and believe me, they are going to be pretty. Now that I'm cutting directly with the grain, it's really moving some material now. And you may not see the saw going too fast down this side of the cut, but the other end is really moving some material. Because I'm changing the angle as I go. I've got the saw like gripped into the end of the wood because it's got like teeth on it. So you can bend the angle down and then cut on your side and then jam it in again and keep bending down. So, you know, it's cutting really, really rapidly. And like I said, this is the same shopping and this whole thing's being done on one shopping. And I'm just going to continue all three cuts right down the butt end all the way down to the cribbin. But I got to be careful. I don't want that bar, that chain to touch the ground at all. That's why we've got it jacked up like that so we can cut right through it. And there's still enough material way down deep in the cut to hold the thing together so I can pass right through here. Now I'm back on the other side and I'm going to continue these cuts down to the butt end of the log. And this is quite a bit of cutting right here. It's deep, there's quite a bit of length to it. You can't get around it, you just have to start cutting. And I'm going to extend this cut all the way down, right through all three of them, all the way to the butt end. Now I can cut right down through it all the way to the cribbing and uh, it's not going to come apart because I couldn't quite extend all the way through near where the crook is. So I'll have to split it right off, but you're moving an awful lot of material right here. It's amazing that you can do that with this little saw, but it really works great. So we're just going to keep going, make sure that we stay right close to the line, try to control ourselves as much as we can, and try to make this cut line up with the cut on the other side. If I had to do this every day and do a lot of these, I'd have to have a much more powerful saw and a much longer bar or I could put them on some sort of a band mill and have it done that way. But these are too wide for the band mill the way they stand right now, so you're stuck with the chainsaw. But I knew I could do it with this chainsaw, so it's getting done and it's getting done properly. Now you can see this end and the three cuts that I've put in there. So that's two knees right there. It's splitting right down through the middle of the heart right there, perfect. Three inches away on both sides. Uh, I'm going to have to split it out because I couldn't reach all the way through with my chainsaw. So I just need down to here. The center of the tree, the heart, is over here. I'm just going to cut that all off. I got a little bit left. I might be able to just split them right off on the side. So that's what I'm going to try to do. All right, let's see if that's enough. See if it'll go.
Ah, there's the knees right there. I'm gonna take them right out of here. Now look at that nice grain right there, swept right around there, just as perfect as can be. You know, there's no other situation or anything else that would do for what I wanna do to make the boat look really, really nice. That's it right there. You know, and it's really the right angle. I'll have to cut it in a little bit, but it's really the right curve. It looked like it was a little bit opened up a little bit more than I need, but it's really not. It's, it's really exactly what I need right there. So that's pretty neat. Now look right down in here because the medullary rays are showing here pretty good. I tried to get it as parallel to them with the cut as I could get it. So when this is finished out, this is gonna pop like you wouldn't believe, like old English furniture or something beautiful. I'll be cutting all the sapwood off like this, you know, all of that stuff you know, because that's not very thick. I'll nip that off with a chainsaw, get it small enough to put it in a bandsaw, and surface it on both sides. You know, so that's it. That's what I was looking for right there. Right there, look at that grain going right around there, just as sweet as pie. You don't get that real easy. That was some effort to get that. You know, you just don't go out and get them. Nobody gives them to you. You know, you have to make an effort. And that's quite an effort for Say somebody my age, you know, this is really teenager stuff right here, but you know, I don't mind and uh, it doesn't wear me out. So it's a lot of fun. Wow, look at this. This is exactly what we were looking for, that grain following it right around like that. I mean, you can't even get anything as pretty as that out of a live oak tree or hackmatack roots or anything like that. And I don't think a lot of people know this stuff is in these oak trees. You know, it's from the trunk to the branch but you really can't tell the difference between the grain at all. It's, it's just beautiful. And uh, look at these medullary rays right here in the oak, 90 degrees to the annual rings. And they're showing up a lot right in there because I've cut it quite parallel to it in both spots right here. That's why they show up so much. But that is a beautiful, beautiful look. The medullary rays, to me, is one of the most beautiful things in wood that I have ever seen. You know, I really want to thank Will for allowing us to be out here and cutting it up and thank Reed for helping me so much. And, you know, we're going to take them back to the shop and dress them up and just see what we can do with them.